With that broad introdu introduction, I'd like to introduce Stephen. He's an expert in responsible algorithms and machine learning. He got an early start on research as a Dymax REU student here. He's now a professor at the University of Minnesota. His PhD uh, won a Best Thesis Award. He won awards at N from NSF, Google, JP Morgan, Facebook, and Mozilla. I got to know Stephen when he was a postdoc, an intern and postdoc at MSR New York, and he was a perfect fit in the lab. He could easily have fit into three of the uh, five research areas we had. And he's here today to tell us his work about making algorithms more fair. Stephen? Great. All right. Um, thanks, Dave, for the wonderful introduction. Um, uh, it's really great to be back here uh, at such an exciting time for Dymex. And of course, when I first heard about this event, uh, the first thing I did was search my name with Dymex, and uh, which you know easily find me this you know almost decade old RU webpage uh, with a list of participants. And you know, as I scroll down, I actually find myself find my own slot. You know. Um, you know, it really brought back a lot of, you know, wonderful memories of that summer in Piscataway. You know, as an undergraduate in a small liberal arts college, I, I didn't have as much opportunity to be exposed to a wide spectrum of, you know, research in mathematics, applied math, pure math, or in different sub-areas, computer science. And, you know, all the conversation I have with all these friends, with the mentor, uh, really play a vital role in my own uh, academic journey. Uh, and I, I'm really grateful for the RU program, and especially for uh, Gene Fiorini, who's, who was my mentor back then, and we became close friends since then. I was pretty much invited to all the Thanksgiving dinners every year uh, since graduate school. Um, okay, um, so you know, Dave had kind of set the context for my talk. Um, so nowadays, machine learning algorithms are often taking in uh, sensitive personal information from people and often inform or make decisions on the same population. Okay, um, you know, concerns have been made that you know these kind of algorithms, like taking in sensitive information from people, might inherit bias uh, or discriminate against some already vulnerable populations. Um, so over the recent years, um, algorithm and machine learning researchers have been thinking about how to actually mitigate these different forms of biases, and perhaps you know maybe make the algorithm fair in, to some extent. And once you start having these kind of technical conversations, it's unavoidable you have to think about mathematical definitions. Um, and what are the definitions, and what does it mean to be fair? Um, and by no means we have actually reached a conclusive answer to that, uh, and I'm not sure we ever will reach a conclusive answer, but we are beginning to understand different notions of fairness, the relationship between them, and also the trade-off among these fairness measures and also utility measure of uh, such an accuracy. Um, so I would like to highlight, you know, maybe one of the most popular approach um, in, you know, largely in the fair machine learning literature. Um, it's called statistical group uh, fairness framework. I'm gonna, you know, state it in a you know, simple setting where an algorithm is making decisions on loan approval. Uh, but you know you can see you know this kind of idea can be generalized to other supervised or unsupervised learning problems. Okay, so suppose you're an algorithm that decide whether to give out loans or not to people. Okay, and you can think about people coming with their feature vector x, um, and also coming with some form of protected attribute. Okay, that can specify perhaps the race or, or gender of the people, and there's some underlying um, pro you know potentially probabilistic classifier that's making the decisions or predictions on these people, you know, deciding whether they will repay the loan eventually or not. So this will be the target variable you're trying to predict, which is the Y. Okay, so within this kind of simple setup, uh, you can actually, you know, derive a rather general recipe, right, uh, of thinking about fairness. You can pick some form of statistics about the underlying classifier. For example, it could be false positive, false negative rate. Uh, of, you know, of the classification, and ask the, this kind of different statistic to be equally, you know, approximately equal across different protected groups specified by these protected attributes, okay? 
Um, some common choices of these kind of statistics include, you know, what we call, you know, statistical parity. Basically, ask for uh, the acceptance rate to be roughly equal across different groups. And you can also talk about uh, more refined statistics like false positive or false negative rates. Um, and also, you know, uh, you can switch the event and condition in the conditional probability and talk about what people call calibration. For this talk, you don't actually need to remember uh, these definitions. Uh, these are, you know, some basic statistics you can define. It obviously, does not capture all possible things you will ask for for fairness, but it does capture some of the basic, you know, statistical desiderata you might hope for, you know, for a classifier. Okay, so suppose these, you know, statistical criteria, uh, what you might ask for um, for fairness uh, in the classification task, uh, what could, you know, potentially go wrong, even if these are the criteria you're ask asking for. Okay, so suppose there are actually multiple protected attributes. Okay, so that's to specify different people in the groups. Uh, in this toy example, let's say there are, you know, race and gender you'd like to think about. Uh, one thing you can observe is that, you know, the underlying classifier could satisfy, you know, some of these, you know, aggregate statistic uh, fairness notion on high level marginal subgroups separately for gender and race. But potentially, if you zoom into more refined subgroup, you know, that's defined by pairs of attributes, uh, these fairness notions are, you know, substantially violated. So in this case, you know, it, if you look, think about the simple notion of statistical parity, uh, the algorithm cannot satisfy this notion for high levels, groups, structure, male and female, and, you know, you know blue and green people. Okay, but it used to, if you, you know, zoom into the subpopulation of green male or blue female, you know, the accepted rate is substantially lower. And you can talk about the same thing for other notion of uh, um, statistics. Okay? So the problem we, I'm trying to get at here is you can potentially achieve group fairness at a high level or marginal level uh, by having some form of subgroup discrimination. Okay? So you might, at a high level, you satisfy this kind of aggregate statistic fairness uh, but, you know, you might still substantially violate the, you know, these kind of statistical fairness on subgroups such as, you know, uh, disabled Hispanic women over some age and belong to some income, you know, uh, group. Um, so we would like to think about this uh, problem of subgroup fairness, you know, uh, more carefully. Uh, the first question is how to actually identify what a subgroup mean, okay? Um, so in this joint work with Michael Kearns, Seth Neal, and Aaron Roth, um, we like to formulate identifiable, identifiable subgroup in the population. Uh, so we like to think about there's a class of Boolean function that map the set of attributes, protected attribute to some binary label. So it's all, you know, this is, you know, some class of Boolean function mapping a protected attribute vector to some value zero, one. 1. So if the, the group membership function map this set of protected attribute to 1, you know, uh, this individual belongs to the group. Okay, so Basically, it's just some basic class of Boolean functions, okay? Um, and with this kind of, you know, subgroup formulation, you can start thinking about, you know, the same set of statistical fairness criteria, except that, you know, unlike before, you know, you really have, you know, a few number of attributes and a few number of constraints. Now they have potentially exponential infinite number of constraints, even fixing simple, you know, statistical parity notion of, or a false positive equalization, okay? And if you think about the computational consequent or algorithmic consequent, it becomes kind of interesting. You know, the, prob the, the kind of computational problem that might be trivial or, you know, easy before uh, becomes, you know, rather challenging, right? Uh, the first problem you might think about is, you know, the problem auditing, right? So the auditing is a very simple problem where you observe some black box classifying, making decisions on the underlying population and you decide whether the classifier actually satisfies some form of statistical, you know, notion of fairness. You know, before we get to this subgroup structure, you know, auditing is really about checking a few numbers and see whether they match up. But now you actually have potentially exponentially uh, or infinite number of subgroups. This problem becomes much more interesting. Uh, of course, you can also ask the problem of learning. Can you actually train a classifier uh, that minimize error or, or maximize accuracy subject to this exponentially many constraints on subgroup fairness. Okay, 
I'm not going into details of the technical result, but the punchline here is uh, in, in th these two papers, we actually provide a computationally efficient algorithm for solving these problems, um, given access to standard supervised learning oracle without any fairness constraint. Okay, so, uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, so, it, you know, computational intractability may not be direct, you know, conflict with some of these strong notion of subgroup fairness. Okay, so I want to push the boundary a bit further, okay? Um, you might ask for something even stronger, right? Something stronger than just subgroup fairness. Can we say something about individual fairness? So if you look at each one of us, we really just eventually subgroup to size one in the population. Um, can we say something about this? Um, so back in 2012, there's a very nice paper uh, by Dwork et al. Uh, they have a very compelling notion of individual fairness uh, that basically says something rather simple. It's asking for you know, similar individuals to be treated similarly. Um, so while this seems to be a very compelling notion, um, one thing you know, that's maybe unsatisfying for putting this notion to practice is you know, this kind of uh, metric or similarity measure across individuals is quite unspecified. It, is, it wasn't not talked about extensively in the original paper. Um, and we start to think about, you know, where does this you know, metric or whether this, where this uh, similarity measure eventually should come from. And one, you know, thing we think about, maybe we should ask for, ask this metric from some experts. Okay, so, so there are some underlying challenges for taking this, you know, you know elicitation approach. First, it's unlikely the experts can actually express the notion of fairness as you know, a quantitative, fully specified quantitative metric, okay? It's unlikely that, you know, we, we can actually write down a complicated metric like this. Or it's not even clear that, you know, this kind of, you know, similarity notion or fairness notion is implicitly consistent with some underlying metric. Uh, even if they could enunciate that, uh, you know, it's unlikely that a group, a panel of experts uh, would agree on a single metric or similarity measure. Um, but perhaps there is some form of silver lining, even though it's very hard to directly ask for this potentially very complicated object of metric, we can ask some very simple questions about, uh, you know, underlying pairs of individuals. We can formulate a question such as, you know, if I present you with two individuals with, you know, the described feature vectors, you can think about whether these two particular individuals should be treated similarly or not. So uh, in the more recent work uh, with Chris John, Michael Kearns, Seth New, Aaron Roth, and my PhD student, Logan Stapleton, uh, we start exploring this subjective fairness approach, okay? Um, so, you know, one thing we, we want to do is, you know, we would like to actually, you know, provide this kind of survey uh, to elicit individual subjective fairness feedback. And on top of which, we would like to collect this feedback and actually build algorithm that, you know, sort of do the same thing to manage the trade-off between accuracy and fairness. Uh, in this case, we'll be actually trying to minimize the predictive uh, error, uh, while we're trying to also minimize the potential violation against you know, these elicited feedback from the individuals. Um, so we're only start, starting to uh, explore this approach, uh, but I think this is a very you know, promising and interesting one uh, in the literature of fairness, especially as Dave has mentioned, you know, Nothing in this, you know, you know, fair ML world should be purely algorithmic, uh, and you know, it eventually should involve human in you know, all parts of the machine learning pipeline. Um, I'm happy to talk more about this, but that's it for my talk. Thank you. It seems easy to say, uh, should these two individuals be treated the same? Uh, but suppose the treatment were, we're going to take away 2% of your wealth every year. Um, I was watching the debates, and I know that I can't get experts to agree. It, because it depends whether you're rich, whether you have more money than Bernie thinks you should have, or, or that's what Elizabeth thinks you should have. So that's a very good point. I think all these questions has to be context dependent, and you know, 
we do try to provide as much context as possible, including what is what the task is for, and try to describe you know these what the background for these two individuals as well. But you know, by no means we have conclusive answer for this elicitation framework. 